good afternoon everyone uh, the meeting will be recorded and we are started we are starting now okay good good afternoon welcome to all of you my name is adam balzer let me introduce myself at the very beginning so i'm a senior fellow at vis europa a private independent polish think tank which in fact um, is uh, the leader of our project and at the same time i work as program director at the, uh, the jan novak Jerzyński college of uh, eastern europe so um, let me make a short joke because uh, we are going to talk about central europe, europe. So we can say that i am a little bit like franz josef uh, kaiser und koenig uh, emperor and uh, king, because I'm double-headed right now. So, uh, first of all, why we are meeting um, um, today? That's the last event, in fact, virtual Brussels, because we are so, supposed to meet in Stu in person in Brussels, but we are meeting because of the pandemic, COVID online, uh, of our project. Uh, the project is uh, the EU project, uh, co-founded by the European Commission, in the framework of uh, the program Europe for Citizens. And the name is, of course, that's why I mentioned Central Europe, a European success story, here the question mark, and Central Europe from democratic revolutions to EU accession, 1981-2004 uh, and beyond. And uh, we, uh, in fact, uh, we are um, implementing this project together with our partners, Institute for Europe Asia Politik, uh, from uh, uh, Berlin, Hungarian Europe Society from Budapest, and also Metropolitan Prague University. And of course, we have also on board the College of Eastern Europe, and last but not least, our great friends from Gdańsk. Uh, what we have already done within the framework of our project, we have, we have organized uh, several events in Berlin, Gdańsk, Budapest, and Prague. That's the last event um, right now in virtual Brussels. And um, of course, uh, um, the main, uh, 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 our main outcome of our project is definitely uh, our uh, documentary movie, which you are going to uh, watch after our pub, our debate. And also we uh, organized um, a student competition. And today we are meeting because we would like to talk about Europe's East-West divide myth or it is, is it a myth or reality that's the title of our debate and uh, uh, at the same time we would, we would like to because that's another our uh, uh, important uh, outcome is of course our special issue of uh, new eastern uh, journal that's a magazine a remotely magazine which is uh, uh, published by the college of eastern europe in english and uh, right now i would like to give a floor to ivona reichardt um, uh, who is going to present uh, the magazine. So without further delay, please, Ivona, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for, for this opportunity um, to be the participant in this discussion today. Um, as Adam said, part of the project um, that was uh, implemented by, by a team of partners, of international partners, and which focused on um, 1989, the memory of 1989 and 2004 um, in, um, in Europe um, and in specific countries, we uh, prepared a publication of um, articles um, uh, authored by our partner, uh, by um, authors from our partner uh, organizations or affiliated with them. Um, let me show you, um, let me share a screen with you. Uh, just one second. Um, Okay, um, this uh, publication has been edited by Adam and uh, um, it will uh, be distributed together with our magazine called New Eastern Europe, which focuses specifically on the post-Soviet space, but also countries that were once part of the Soviet socialist bloc. Um, or under its influence. Um, the title of the publication, as you see, is uh, a European success story, but with a question mark. Um, so the authors critically look at uh, what happened in, in that period of time between 1989 and 2004 and beyond. 
um, meaning um, they look at the great hope that the revolutions of 1989 and the later uh, expansion um, enlargement of the European Union that took place in 2004 meant for the region and specific countries um, and what actually um, later not necessarily ended up so so positively as we see especially in the case of Hungary and um, Poland. Um, however, even Czechia, which is um, uh, which has less of the negative experiences as Poland and Hungary currently do, also shows some concern and um, and uh, um, problems that that accompanied and characterized the the transformation um, process. Uh, the same can be said about Germany, which um, had uh, uh, in 1999. Um, got reunited um, after a long period of separation of uh, the existence of two parallel German states. And yet um, the, the reunification, um, which took place in 1999, when looked from today's perspective, was not only a, a success story, as, as we see in the title. Mm, I don't want to say too much about the topic, as we will discuss some of these aspects today during the um, the panel, as some of the authors are, are uh, participating in our um, event today, um, I would like to encourage you to, the, to, re uh, to read the publication. It will be also available online in open access, but um, available also in a paper edition free of charge. Uh, we are happy to, to, to ship it to you. Um, I would just like to finish that uh, we end with the publication, we complete the publication with the voices of two young uh, representatives of the uh, um, future generation. Um, the two students uh, who won the essay contest that uh, uh, Adam um, uh, mentioned already. And um, I have to say that when I was reading their essays, I was very impressed with their uh, judgment, uh, with their interpretation of the current situation. Uh, and it gives me hope that um, if many, rep if other representatives of the generation think the way they do, um, we should be okay. But um, <laughs> of course, these are the winners of the contest. Uh, so, so let's see uh, and talk today about the also what what's ahead of us. Um, and with this, I would like to to pass the floor to Adam again. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Ivona for your short introduction. Um, definitely, I would like only to add that uh, besides experts who are uh, uh, pa our partners from our organizations, partner organizations and also students, winners, uh, the winners of our uh, contest. Uh, at the same time, we also have uh, article uh, written by uh, uh, the mayor of Gdańsk, uh, Alexander Durkiewicz, because everything started in Gdańsk, according to Gdańsk, and they are to a certain degree right because of uh, the role of solidarity movement. So it's really not only you know, long articles written by experts, but you can find here different uh, uh, forms. And at the same time, um, uh, I think, of course, it's, uh, that's another Polish joke. It's very difficult to be a judge in your own case, but I would say that to, uh, you can find also interesting illustrations that it's not only text, but also some pictures. Okay, so thank you very much, Ivona, again. And right now I, I have really a great pleasure and honor to ask uh, Professor Catherine Orel uh, uh, to give us um, uh, a keynote uh, speech. It's really, um, I said, it's, I'm not exaggerating right now, a great uh, honor and pleasure for me because uh, I read your books and I like them very much. And I, all of you, I strongly recommend you to um, read uh, books um, uh, that was uh, uh, that were published by Professor Orel. Um, definitely, her uh, specialité de la maison is uh, uh, Hungary, and um, she uh, uh, wrote, for instance, an excellent uh, biography of uh, Admiral Horthy. Uh, uh, she also wrote a very good. Uh, uh, history of Budapest, and also uh, she has just published recently uh, again a uh, wonderful history of uh, Hungarian nation. I think it was published uh, just a few months ago. So uh, really, uh, a great scholar uh, is with us today, and I'm very happy. Uh, and uh, of course, um, she received uh, a lot of 
uh, great uh, awards, uh, for instance, uh, uh, um, uh, Pri Guizot, uh, uh, um, uh, also Pri and uh, Le Monon. Um, so, uh, really, we have a distinguished uh, scholar with us today. And uh, I would like to ask you, Professor Orel, to share with us, especially your opinion regarding, again, I, I will use my French story sometimes from my uh, pronunciation, which is uh, maybe sometimes horrible, but nevertheless, um, definitely, I, I would like to ask you to talk a little bit about long durée. Uh, these uh, uh, trends, which are of long duration, what kind of uh, context we can observe impact of history, culture on especially processes taking place in our region and uh, the perception of the region, the image, the view of the region in the Western Europe. Um, I have already said that you are really uh, a great expert on Hungary, but you also publish a very good history of modern Central Europe uh, from the beginning of the 19th century until exactly uh, the beginning of the 21st century and uh, the Big Bang uh, enlargement of 2004. So please, uh, Professor Orel, the floor is yours, still to play. Thank you very much for all these uh, very, uh, very pleasant uh, introductory remarks and, and presentation of myself. I feel very flattered. Um, I have to say that some of these books you mentioned uh, are translated in Hungarian. So <laughs> very sorry that, uh, French and Hungarian are maybe, maybe not the most uh, shared uh, languages, at least French was, <laughs> but is no, more, is no more the case. And uh, if you don't know French, that maybe you could try Hungarian. Um, so um, uh, another, uh, another very, very small remark. Um, I have many, many hats on my head. One of these hats is to be the president of the International Committee for Historical Sciences. And I would like to, um, I told Isabella just before we started, I would like to invite everyone to attend uh, our uh, 22nd World Congress, which is going to take place at the end of August in Poznan. Uh, I will, after my talk, I will put in the chart uh, in, in the chat, I will put you the, um, the indication to, um, to make a little bit of advertising for this, uh, for this Congress. And I think that would be a very good um, occasion for uh, many scholars of human sciences, so not only historians, to uh, come to this uh, uh, Congress in, in Poznan. It will be a big event. After two years of postponing, <laughs> we hope very much that this year everyone will be uh, physically present uh, in Poznan because we refused uh, for such a huge Congress with thousands of participants to have an uh, online Congress. Uh, it was too sad for us, so we preferred, it was the choice of the, of the board, uh, we preferred uh, to postpone the Congress and to have it uh, in, real, in real presence so that uh, people can really meet uh, each other and especially for the younger ones, for the doctorate students, for the, the posters, participants and so on, that's absolutely crucial that they meet really with, uh, with real people. So um, that was the real, uh, uh, very brief uh, uh, remark. Uh, uh, the second one is I was, I was very uh, um, amused by uh, Adam's uh, indication that he feels a little bit like Kaiser Franz Josef, um, being emperor and king. So uh, as an historian, of course, and, and as an historian of 19th century, century Europe, which means Habsburg Empire, I'm particularly pleased uh, to not have been the one who introduced Franz Josef into the debate, but you did it, Adam, so thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's very funny, and, and by the way, it's not completely out of place, uh, which I will try to um, uh, not demonstrate, but I will certainly uh, speak of this um, Habsburg uh, past, if not to speak about Habsburg nostalgia, uh, when we speak of uh, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, actually, and uh, also to prove that um, East-West divide 
uh, when we think of east-west divide, we simply forgot the center. So uh, I will try to move back to Central Europe and maybe it will be a kind of uh, introduction to the to the debate which is going to take place after, uh, which uh, intends to uh, overcome this uh, exaggeration of east-west uh, divide, if just like if there was no center and. Well, I want I want to to prove that there is a center. Um, this it was my job actually in the book, which was just mentioned about uh, about Central Europe. And uh, the other um, maybe a provocative question I would like to introduce first is uh, this time from eighty nine to today is it history? Uh, you know, uh, historians uh, are sometimes a little bit touchy about uh, doing history without archives. And uh, the former generation of uh, professors and historians uh, would not have considered this uh, present day or histoire du temps présent, as we say in French, and would have preferred to analyze uh, facts, phenomena, and so on with the help of uh, an intense and extensive documentation, which means archives. So the, the first thing I would like to ask is, can we really reflect on the time passed since 89 as if it was history? I think we can. Uh, and uh, the, the, one of the elements why I think we can is because we have something the former generations didn't, uh, of historians, uh, didn't uh, t take care to have, which means witnesses. So uh, for, uh, let's, present it like this. If a younger scholar comes now, someone who is 25, 27, and comes now and says, I want to work on this time, uh, he will, he or she will consider it is history. Uh, and sometimes I do not consider history, it's history because I lived through it. I, I, I was a student in Vienna in 88, uh, 89. And I can assure you that I spent more time over the border than in the uh, lecture halls of the University of Vienna, because I really had the feeling something is happening and I have to be in the middle of it. So the methodological uh, question is also, how do you work on a time, on, on a period, which you know so well because you were a part of it and not only witnessing from far away, I mean, through television or, or newspapers, but a, a period you had the chance, because I think it was a chance, it was an extraordinary opportunity. And I'm very happy to be so aged now that I can say I lived through it and I can tell you stories about that. Even if it's not history, it means stories, which is also another uh, kind of methodological uh, gap. And um, so, how do you deal with this time when? You are actor. If I, I do not pretend to have been a, a, an actor, I didn't make history. I was just on the spot and I was able to uh, take part in some of the events which took place, at least in Hungary, at the beginning of uh, 89. Uh, also in Vienna, I was at the burial of uh, Zita. I was then at the burial, reburial of uh, Imre Nadi. I was at the European picnic and so on. So I have uh, quite a lot of uh, memories of that time. And uh, there is a, a, a real difference be between memory and history. And this is sometimes what our uh, leaders of uh, today, Central Europe, uh, tend to mix. It, they pretend to uh, memorialize something which they call history, but it's not. It's memory politics. It is not the history made by historians. And this is also why many people are shocked at this uh, manipulation or uh, uh, fake uh, historical data, because sometimes they really can say, we were there, and it's not like you say it was. So. 
This is also a, a very important uh, factor we have to take into account when we uh, work as historians on this um, time period, is that we have so many witnesses, and as you know, uh, from the, the theorician of uh, memory, Maurice Halbwax, you have as many memories as you have individuals. So even if there were a thousand, uh, hundred thousand of people witnessing the burial of uh, Imre and Oye, each one will tell you maybe another story of that day. So it's really, it's really a challenge in some, in some ways to make history of that time period taking into account all the levels of uh, historical experience, memory experience uh, we, can, uh, we can have. And um, this is uh, something we have to keep in mind uh, all the time when we uh, reflect on that, uh, on that period. So um, that was a brief, sorry, I was already too long, uh, introductory remark. And um, I think that what is happening in, in those days now, I mean, with the tensions uh, uh, in Eastern Europe, um, it reminds me very much of the moment uh, between 89 and 91, when uh, there were quite a lot of tensions uh, around the Baltic states with uh, this uh, spectrum and this, this uh, phantom of possible intervention of, uh, of the not even uh, at that time uh, uh, still existing uh, Soviet Union. And um, it was a very, a very tense uh, period when um, the process that we are uh, describing now was not so evident, was not so obvious in front of our eyes. We were not so sure at that time that uh, what the all of Central Europe and what is Central Europe, by the way, but I will not annoy you about, about the definitions of Central Europe, but um, the different situations in the different countries, even the former countries belonging, I mean, real, in the real border of the Soviet Union, were not um, uh, a, re a real uh, a ready cut uh, situation that was going to happen. Things evolved from um, the beginning of eighty nine to the collapse of the Soviet Union in uh, in ninety one. So uh, sometimes when we read some descriptions of the, uh, the integration process and uh, uh, the reunion process of Europe. Uh, these chronological, very, very um, precise steps are forgotten uh, in, the, in the old uh, picture, uh, in the manuals, in the, in the school books, uh, and so on. And this is a, a, a really uh, a challenging uh, point that we keep on reflecting on these chronological uh, um, differences between, uh, between the uh, various uh, countries. So uh, uh, another um, uh, question I would like to raise is um, the, uh, um, the phraseology we had at this time, which was, oh, uh, these countries uh, are coming back to Europe. It, it is a return to Europe. And uh, at one point, I can even uh, remember um, the Austrian Chancellor uh, Wolfgang Schussel saying, welcome back. And saying that as an, Aust as an Austrian Chancellor, it was quite, I mean, I'm sorry, stupid. So it was somehow an absurdity to uh, pretend that these countries of Central Europe were not European. Of course, the ID was a very Western ID that was saying, oh, they have been cut by the uh, Iron Curtain from us. So the, you see already this uh, exaggeration we are uh, uh, witnessing somehow these days as well, is that uh, it is the West which defines what the East has to think. But this is not how people uh, felt at that time. Uh, they were just as European as everyone in Europe. Only they had been, of course, in this very different situation in which they felt estranged from 
uh, the Europe they belong to since the Middle Ages. Uh, and this is, this is really a, a, a first point, I think, a first element of misunderstanding between some Western uh, decision makers and, uh, and what they called, they call East. You know, in France, in French, uh, there is still quite a lot of people who persist on saying l'Europe de l'Est. And each time, uh, not only me, but also colleagues and, 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 and well-informed uh, journalists say, well, wait a minute, it's, it's over, game over since 89. So stop saying that. I mean, it's always putting this East-West divide from the West to the East. And this should really cease if we want to uh, uh, build on a more uh, uh, solid uh, basis. So uh, the, um, I would like to recall on this topic uh, something everyone knows but has not read probably. It's the very, very famous uh, article published by Milan Kundera in 83 in uh, the French uh, journal uh, Le Débat. And uh, in this uh, article, uh, Kundera was very much speaking of Central Europe. And in speaking of Central Europe, he was actually speaking of Western Europe, Western values, which were not only uh, uh, Western in the, in the geographical sense, but Western in the philosophical sense, which meant democracy, uh, liberal access uh, to media uh, uh, and so on. And this is not uh, uh, a chance that uh, it was a Czech who said that. Because, of course, being from, uh, from the Czech lands, he felt more attracted to uh, Western uh, civilization, culture, uh, than uh, maybe someone would have uh, sought in Bucharest or somewhere else. So these differences are extremely important to, uh, to understand, and they are very often um, not only forgotten, but simply ignored by uh, many of our uh, Western uh, analysts and, and, and decision makers and, and even polit politologists uh, and so on. So uh, this... Um, this idea of uh, having, been, having been separated from, uh, from the West is absolutely linked with the idea of having been a victim, of having been, having been a victim of history, a victim of the great powers, and not only uh, since uh, the Second World War, but it's a very, very uh, deeply rooted, ancient uh, feeling of not being um, uh, deciding on uh, uh, on the on the own fate uh, of the uh, of the country, and this is also something which is very um, lasting, uh, burdening uh, the uh, the societies uh, of uh, of uh, Central Europe, and this is also something that has to be uh, overcome. It is very very hard. Um, historians are really working on that. But again, um, some uh, politicians, deci decision makers, and media people keep on um, uh, nourishing the society with this idea of victimization and of uh, trauma and uh, of um, having been uh, uh, estranged from what should have been their uh, fate. And this is also inseparable from the notion of backwardness, uh, also a very heavy burden, uh, very long lasting, long durée kind of uh, phenomena. And um, this uh, notion of backwardness is, um, is uh, also uh, 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 an element of not the east-west divide, but the north-south divide. And this is also uh, 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 an element that is, uh, that is absolutely fascinating, because if you divide east and west and uh, north and south, what remains? Uh, only west or 
is not the solution in really bringing all these parts together. And the point where all these parts have to be together is probably the center. So uh, again, I preach for uh, uh, the, the coming back of Central Europe into, uh, into the uh, debate. It was actually a very um, a crucial moment of the integration process. I, I suppose everybody remembers of the creation of the Visegrad uh, group and of this uh, reunion of uh, a smaller Europe, which would be uh, Central Europe, Europe. And at that time, uh, you remember there was the, the, um, the idea of having uh, a step-by-step -step integration with some uh, um, levels to attain before uh, you enter into the, into the union. And one of these, uh, uh, anti-chamber of, uh, of the integration was maybe the Visegrad group. And at that time, it was the ID of uh, the negative ID of um, Prime Minister Václav Klaus, who said, oh, this is not interesting. We don't want to be part of this. He, he did, it, but he said that it will, he will not tolerate to be put in the waiting room uh, for uh, the European Union and that it was not uh, a place to be and that he would not be content with somehow a smaller uh, um, uh, to be integrated Europe and that the idea was to join uh, uh, right away uh, the, European, uh, the European Union. So uh, um, the, the process of integration was also a very uh, um, uh, uh, layered uh, process that uh, led to what we call now a success story, and I think we are right to call it a, su a success story. Um, but uh, as you said in the in the introduction, uh, both uh, Isabella and, and Adam, uh, is that we have, <clears throat> of course, parts of society, uh, parts of the political uh, elite, political groups that uh, deny this uh, this success and that try to convince their uh, uh, public opinions that uh, the European Union is not a success is something uh, you know all these uh, uh, sentences like uh, everything is deciding in, in Brussels. Brussels is uh, behaving with us like Moscow did, and all this kind of uh, nonsense that unfortunately uh, are. Um, Swallowed by some uh, parts of the uh, of the of the uh, European uh, European uh, by the by the, the the population by the public opinion. And what of the uh, an another uh, interesting um, uh, point is to uh, reflect on what would uh, well you know normally it's the uh, it's the mortal sin of the historian to make anachronism and to say what. Uh, what would have been if, was wäre wenn, uh, in, in German. But um, when uh, the, the, the transformation of 89 occurred, uh, in the years, in just the years before, uh, there were some um, politologists, uh, historians, opinion makers, um, some politicians as well. We can, we can remember Erhard Busek in, in Austria and, and others in Germany. Uh, in West Germany, of course, who were, think, uh, who were thinking of what would be, what could be the possible solutions to break the divide, which was at that time the Iron Curtain, to break the divide between East and West. So we had all these ideas about federation uh, that were just after um, the breakup of 89 were completely um, outdated, forgotten, still of course, nourishing the reflection. And I think it is, it is something uh, interesting. And also the possible third way, uh, which was uh, something also very popular in the 80s, in the 70s even. Um, and another uh, topic that came, to, the, the only topic that came to be a little bit more of a reality was the regional uh, integration or the, the regional identity. Uh, which was promoted actually by the union, and I think with uh, with good reason uh, to uh, um, also to convince 
the, the, the public opinions that uh, some regions belonged to together. There were sometimes, of course, uh, cut by a border, which was a new border, even after sometimes after the First World War, sometimes after the Second. And that uh, we should not forget the past, of course, and the, the links, the relations, the border relations, the border crossing, you know, the Grenz, the Grenzgänger, as we say in German, that uh, were important uh, aspects of this regional cooperation. And I think that was one of the very positive um, uh, uh, moments and still is of the uh, uh, of the European uh, of the European Union. So um, I would like now to conclude because I, I think I've already already been too long. Um, and to re I would like to come back to Adam's uh, idea about Franz Josef. So, uh, you know, uh, also in the 80s and uh, mid 80s, there was a, a, a very big nostalgia of uh, Habsburg Empire, Habsburg Europe, uh, even afterwards, because people said, well, you know, the European Union, we had it already. It was the Habsburg Empire. United Army, United Money, no, no borders, no frontiers, um, equal languages, more or less, uh, inside, of the, inside of the empire. So why should not be, uh, why the, the Habsburg Empire should not be the model of the European, uh, of the European Union? So um, uh, sometime in, at, at his time, at the end of his time, uh, Franz Josef was seen as a completely outdated monarch. He said to, uh, um, to Theodore Roosevelt, I feel like the, 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 the last uh, Cavaliers uh, Europas. But uh, in the end, <laughs> I, would, I would joke and say, he, he, would, it, would, it, would Franz Josef not be one of the uh, paternal uh, figures of, uh, of United Europe as he was for his his peoples, as was the saying at that time. And I know that we are now looking for um, European personalities to put on the banknotes, on the Euro banknotes. And I personally, I would like to propose Franz Josef for one of these, of these banknotes. I know I'm completely uh, uh, fantasizing and joking, but uh, well, maybe not so much. So I thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to hear uh, what is going to be said in the oncoming debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Oral, for your excellent uh, speech. It was really short and snappy. And of course, I'm not going to miss that opportunity that we uh, have you here. And maybe let me abuse a little bit my position. And I would like to pose one question uh, because, um, as I said uh, before, um, you are author of a very good, uh, the author of a very good uh, biography of um, Admiral Horty. And at the same time, of course, uh, you mentioned in your speech uh, the topic which is also in Poland uh, very important, namely uh, the politics of memory, Gershit's politics. And uh, I would like to ask you because um, definitely Istvan will talk uh, quite a lot about uh, upcoming elections in uh, Hungary at the beginning of April. Yeah. So my question would be, what do you think if you can evaluate a little bit uh, I, I know it's uh, almost mission impossible to, in a few minutes, really to um, assess, evaluate uh, uh, the politics of memory of current uh, uh, friend, uh, uh, Hungarian government. But if you can try, uh, re re especially regarding the interwar period, and uh, Admiral Hort, if you can share with us uh, some um, your uh, um, opinions on that. Well, <laughs> I think I think uh, our friend uh, Ege Dushishvan has something to say as well on this on this <laughs> on this topic. And by the way, I'm very pleased to see you, Ishvan. We we didn't meet for ages. Um, well, uh, nice, to, nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> First of all, I will not propose Admiral Horty for a banknote. <laughs> 
be be sure be sure of that uh but uh, of course he's quite innocent of what is now made in his in his name which is which is of course uh, absolutely uh, uh impossible um first i cannot predict what is going to happen on april 3rd uh, uh nevertheless i uh, look forward uh, to a change let's put it like that and um, and i think we already have very interesting uh, uh People uh, reflecting reflecting on that what could what could happen on April third. Um, I said a little bit in my talk that uh, memory politics was uh, much uh, a confusion of uh, history and memory, and that uh, sometimes we should uh, explain to the politicians that it's not the same. Um, and um, the government for age for for many years now is trying to impose is on uh, its own uh, um, reading of history in um, inscribing it into into the memory politics which means uh moving and removing uh, statues uh, uh building uh, fake uh, memorials uh, here of course i i uh, i'm talking i'm referring to the the memorial uh, for the german occupation which is on on sabachak there which is an absolute fake um and i cannot detail it i did it in my book you had the, you had the, the 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 kindness to recall my book on the hungarian nation there is an entire part of the book which is dedicated to the memory politics so so i cannot i really cannot uh, reflect on that but um i i i, I can only deplore the fact that um uh, this uh, uh confusion between history and memory is missing its point actually because uh if you constantly change the um, uh, memory landscape of a city in 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 this case uh, I'm, I'm talking about budapest uh in the end you miss your point because people have no idea of what are these memorials made for they only see the changes uh some uh, part of the civil society of course oppose uh but there was they were not vandalized i sh i shall mention uh only as I said, for the, mon the monument in Sobochak there, you have, as probably many of you know, in front of this monument, you have the 11 M Lake Mu, which is the spontaneous uh, contest on the monument. And the perversity of the government is to leave it there, saying, look how democratic we are, look how liberal we are, because opponents can express themselves and put their own uh, um, opposing monument in front of ours. So uh, we are constantly uh, uh, being uh, uh, constrained to explain to the public opinion, to, uh, to the, the citizens, even in Hungary itself, I mean, even for myself, I, I lectured many times to explain what the government is doing with this uh, uh, absurd uh, politics of memory that in the end, I, I think, I, I actually, I hope, miss the point of um, forcing, obliging the, the citizens to build a new image of their own history. So uh, you cannot decide only by putting statues at one spot and removing others that uh, people will change their appreciation of history. And um, this is also made by uh, school books, which are also very uh, contestable in, in, in Hungary. So uh, the goal of the government of course is to uh, uh, have its own uh, agenda with with history with with uh, uh, the historical uh, discourse and it is uh, the task of the historians and as, as you know the uh, the historical Acad the historical institute of the academy of sciences was very very threatened by uh, well as as other institutes of the academy uh, by the government uh, that also the only people who can really explain what is going on would be make uh, silent 
and this is absolutely uh, uh, condemnable. And uh, I, I, I really look forward uh, to a, a real change in this in this politics because it's absolutely uh, uh, not sane for a country to have constantly this double discourse. And this double discourse really reminds us of what was before. So there was a, an, a, an official historical discourse, and there was an alternative historical discourse in the families, uh, in, in circles uh, that were not uh, official and were not able to uh, uh, express themselves. So actually, uh, this reflects we had before. Uh, I, I, I am very sorry to say we have to reactivate them because uh, we must really fight for, uh, for uh, I would not say historical truth, because we all know that it's, it's, it's just a, a dream, but at least historical debate based on real uh, um, uh, intellectual uh, reflection. Merci beaucoup, personal, <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, I think that we really got uh, a food for thought from you, and we can uh, smoothly move to uh, the second uh, part, our roundtable online uh, uh, discussion. Uh, of course, uh, Professor Oler, please stay with us, because after interventions of um, our panelists, uh, I would like to have a discussion with our viewers and also with you. So. Um, the title of uh, our uh, online discussion is, in fact, uh, She Democratic Revolutions and EU Adhesion, Overcoming Exaggerated Divisions Between East and West. So first of all, of course, we can say that we have already made some kind of coming out mission statement because we use this term that uh, we can talk about exaggeration that uh, these divisions are exaggerated. Uh, what does it mean East and West in that case, of course? Let's uh, clarify this. But before, let me introduce speakers. And I will start with ladies first, of course, Ivona Freyhardt, um, a great friend, uh, friend of mine, who is uh, Deputy Editor-in-Chief of New Eastern Europe, but also a member of the uh, board of the College of Eastern Europe. Then we have David, David Nonhoff, who is a research associate, associate sorry, um, uh, in an institute for Europäische Politik. Then Istvan Högedus, who is the president of Hungarian Europe Society. And last but not least, finally, Vit Benesh, lecturer at Metropolitan Prague University. And um, all uh, our colleagues are, of course, the members of our uh, team representing organizations uh, of our consortium. So let me start uh, just to maybe steer a little bit discussion. Uh, maybe I will be a little bit provocative. So uh, very briefly, uh, I uh, made a um, small research in um, Polish media, regional media. I don't speak Hungarian, sorry, but for example, in Czech media and also in Western media in German language. Uh, in uh, German main media or French media. Uh, what does it mean when these terms are used? In fact, I wanted to check that. Uh, East, West, uh, uh, regarding uh, within the uh, EU, not outside the EU, but within the EU. So, of course, I didn't discover America, but generally these terms are used, especially this term East, to describe is we can say oversimplification definitely to describe the countries that joined uh, uh, the EU in 2004, 7, 2007, and 2013. So the big bank and generally countries, post-communist countries, because we have to exclude Cyprus and Malta, who joined the EU and they are sometimes called new member states, a new euro. And in that case, of course, there is a um, some kind of cliches, stereotypes, and prejudices towards the region that we can say that uh, there is um, some kind of perception that, of course, the region has a serious problem with rule of law, democracy, some kind of democratic backsliding, 
uh, dismantling of rule of law, uh, the problem with media freedom. And if we look, I decided to provide you right now with a, a little bit eagle's eye view and to share with you some basic data. And then I will ask you to uh, react. So according, for example, to the Freedom House, which of course a prominent US foundation, uh, they uh, regularly every year they uh, publish uh, the uh, report. And according to the rankings, in fact, if we take these countries, so-called East, there is one country uh, which uh, was three, four years ago relegated to the category of uh, partly free countries, namely Hungary, unfortunately, that we uh, unfortunately have a democratic backsliding in Poland, according to the Freedom House, and we can have a, a maybe, unfortunately, Budapest in Warsaw, that's reality. And definitely, according to them, certain countries in the region, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, besides Poland and Hungary, they also have some more serious problems with uh, the quality of their democracies. If we compare with so-called the West, but in fact, we, uh, in, in, the, in this case, the rest of the EU, there is no country, according to the Freedom House, with these kind of problems. The same regarding the Transparency International and the Corruption Perception Index. We can say that below 50, that you have 100, no corruption, no country in the world, and zero, a total corruption, complete corruption. So besides 50, we have Greece from the rest of Europe, and in case of our region, unfortunately, Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary. And uh, what happened to Hungary is something unbelievable regarding this slight, dramatic, unfortunately. But we have again the problem that if you look at other countries, uh, between 50 and 60 scores, you have Poland, Slovakia, Czechia, Slovenia, Latvia. A lot, sorry, uh, by comparison, Italy, and uh, Malta and Cyprus in this group, between 50 and 60, uh, these uh, scores. So again, it doesn't look very nice. Let's put it uh, uh, in that very uh, subtle, delicate way. And then we have media freedom. Of course, we have uh, reporters from Frontier, the Reporters Without Borders. And here again, we have this uh, the abolition of the media from very difficult situation to good situation and um, between these two categories, um, the extreme categories, you have uh, um, uh, different shades of gray and you have uh, problematic situation, difficult situation. So again, if you look from this point of view, we have three countries with problematic situation, Poland, Hungary, Croatia, and Hungary going down, unfortunately, also Poland, but not to such a degree, to the category of difficult situation of the media in Bulgaria. So we have three countries plus Bulgaria, four countries from 11. And uh, regarding the rest of Europe, we, uh, the EU, I'm sorry, we have Malta and Greece in the category of problematic countries. So you can see that, yes, there is something. It's not only myth. There is something going on, something negative. But there is also, but like, you know, with the, uh, glass empty, half empty or, or half full. So in that case, we can counter this narrative, this image by saying, okay, but uh, there is a huge diversity within the so-called East. You can compare Estonia to Hungary, for instance. You can also, comp uh, you, you can say that there is no white and black, the EU that we have uh, uh, Canada versus North Korea. Canada means uh, the West and the East, North Korea. No, we have also certain problems, challenges in, in the Western Europe regarding the rise of certain far-right radical parties. Look at current, for example, what uh, the, uh, for example, opinion polls in France. Still, I, I hope the, to make this more coming out that Madame Le Pen is not going, in my opinion, to win the elections. Nevertheless, right now she enjoys the support according to a survey of 45% uh, of uh, people in the second round, a possible second round, uh, because probably she will secure the second round. So 
I will stop here and I will ask you, all of you, that's a general question. If you can assess, uh, not from the perspective of your country, but that's a short, the first short question, short reaction. What do you think about this division? It, the East versus West. What, uh, what is your evaluation? What is your point on that? Please. Ivona, let's start with you. Okay, so I should speak about the regional perspective? Yeah. Uh, okay. you, what do you think about this division, East and West? It's a myth. Let's answer this question. It's a myth or reality. Okay, I agree with the uh, Professor Aurel that uh, saying welcome back to Europe was very unjust. Uh, and um, at least the way I was educated, I was, uh, and I was educated in a communist time um, in a primary school that I was a European. So I also remember this rhetoric and I remember finding it strange. Um, I knew we were poorer, I knew we were on the other side, but I never thought that we were not European. So so for us to, to get this Europeanized in, in the 90s, uh, I think we accepted it because we, as I said, we, economically we were uh, worse off. And I think this had a huge effect on our perception of ourselves in the 90s. Mm, and, and and also this perception of the East as not only being maybe democratically um, less perfect or authoritarian, but also economically. I think this had a huge um, huge effect on, on, on the perception and the division and the um, maintenance of the division because we were the ones who were catching up in many in many way, ways. So, for our region in the 90s, the West was always perceived as something better. And um, the question is, was this a myth or reality? I think at that time it was a reality. Um, we were catching up uh, with the democratic process uh, processes, uh, adjusting our demo uh, systems, transferring our systems from um, non-democratic to democratic, but we're also adjusting economically. Um, and we were doing this because we're driven and Poland here, as, as you know, was, which I'm representing, was a champion of that, or in one of the main engines of this process, of course, nowadays we know what is happening. But at that time we were so determined to join the European Union. And there were different reasons why we wanted to join NATO and the European Union. One of them was our security and, and, and also the well-being. And then we joined the European Union in 2004. The dream came true. And together with the European Union, what happened? Uh, a lot of people started actually migrating, um, leaving homes. Uh, at that time, unemployment in Poland was extremely high. Um, and a lot of people found jobs in the this dreamland in the West, yes. And, uh, and then this is the really first time when um, on mass scale, people started having the real experience. So reality came um, uh, with the West, uh, they moved to the, especially to the UK. Um, and, and they started discovering that the West is something different than they've been told, um, they had been told, um, because they did not only experience the, the, the image that they saw on TV, um, yes, of, of the wealth and uh, happy life, but they, they, they saw that working conditions are not always perfect, that migrants are treated differently than, for example, the British society. Um, so I think the first... Um, um, maybe this I don't want to say disappointment but the reality check came and then uh, so from the now from the Polish perspective uh, as you know in 2015 we we had elections that were a turning point and ever since that Poland is called to be on this backslide and everybody's surprised why uh, Poland uh, departed from this you know we were this engine etc and then when we analyzed these uh, elections we also noticed that people who um, who are migrants who who live in the UK in Norway? They don't necessarily vote for the democratic um, parties in Poland, like the Civic Platform. They actually started voting voting quite um, nationalistic, and then we discovered that maybe the experience of living abroad 
for um for them it, it it didn't mean that they learned the lessons of multiculturalism openness you know liberal political values democracy freedom of speech um instead what we uh, found, find out is that they they enjoyed the welfare state uh, that these countries offered and that our country um, was not offering because we were catching up economically so much that we chose the neoliberal model um, at the cost of the oftentimes of, of the working people. Um, and that's why um, many of these people chose the, the law and justice, which actually started offering um, what we uh, criticize as a political bribery, but it actually is a, um, is a uh, economic program to help uh, families that is quite uh, common in the West like in Germany, the so-called Kindergeld, money for children. Mm, uh, yes, so so another reality check. So, you know, um, there are myths and uh, they throw the transformation we've been seeing, of course, the, the myths. Uh, but I would not say that the myths are only such that um, the, uh, that the uh, uh, of course, the myths glorify, but then the reality comes, and uh, um, this West that, that that we that you presented again, Adam, through your statistics, and I 100% agree. I'm not denying any of these uh, phenomena taking place, and I assess them negatively. Mm, uh, but uh, the West uh, is not always for people, for for the general society. The experience of only this positive that that the statistics show, that the myth shows. Um, sometimes this is uh, this is something negative, and I don't want to say that this is only because we are close-minded, nationalistic. I'm really uh, uh, tired with this discourse that what happened to Poland, Poland just went crazy. Uh, no, I think Poland did not go crazy in 2000. 15 uh, something we, we made uh, a bad choice i would say but i think we um need to also make a critical assessment of our transformation and uh, certain mistakes that were made before that led people to this to making this electoral choice uh, to voting for these specific parties um and uh, and as i mentioned one of them was this experience of the west that actually opened eyes to many people in Poland that um, maybe something is wrong with our economic system. Maybe this West looks differently than we were told before. And, and here we found parties, um, political parties that told um, voters that it's okay to be a little, I don't want to say barbarian, but you know, you, you don't need to be so cosmopolitan. You don't need to be so liberal. It, it's okay to have your prejudice. It's okay to be scared of immigrants. Um, and it's okay to want some money, to, to want the money that people in the West are getting. So um, unfortunately, the, uh, this is how it got changed in our case, that uh, the assumption of 2004 was that we will, um, we will become kind of the same. Yeah, welcome to Europe. Um, but, uh, but many mistakes were made also by our political leaders and our political parties here. And I think this is uh, uh, coupled with this experience, of, uh, with direct experience with the West that, that turned out different than expected for many people. That's what led us to, to what we are today. Thank you very much, Ivona. I think definitely it is inevitable to overlap this general overview and uh, our country cases that's uh, of course obvious. So. Not a problem. Great to bring. Uh, thank you very much for bringing into equation this uh, very important issue of immigration and uh, uh, direct, in fact, a direct first contact, uh, personal contact with uh, uh, the Western Europe. And uh, of course, um, uh, you're right that uh, I said that we are diverse in the East, but so called the West is also very diverse and you can have very different experiences. So let's move to our. I mean, from Polish point of view, Western neighbor, Germany. Uh, David, as you know, uh, we have published um, in our report uh, article written by Simone Klein, uh, uh, Katrin Bottinger. And uh, of course, uh, uh, they focus especially on the issue which is very related to um, 89, namely, namely the reunification of Germany. And, the legacy of reunification, which is definitely 
complex one. We can say that this division east and west, nostalgia, this nostalgia, uh, nostalgia uh, uh, related to the uh, east Germany is of course still uh, the issue in your country. We have uh, of course different uh, uh, patterns of um, uh, electoral behavior, voting, uh, specificity of the east Germany like Alternative for Deutschland, Die Link, and so on. So please, the floor is yours. Share with us your take, or can you give us your uh, position on, on uh, uh, that issue, namely the East versus West in, within the EU and also a little bit within Germany, please. Sure. Um, thank you, first of all, for, for inviting me and for having this discussion, which I think is a really, really important uh, discussion. Um, it's especially come i mean having grown up in western germany um I, I i can unfortunately say that many of the myths that we are talking about about this divide between eastern and western europe um they are still present in the heads of many germans i believe so i think this is a really really important endeavor to talk about these myths to talk about these prejudices and to try to overcome them and maybe to, to give you a, a personal example, I was, I was born in 1991, so right at the time of the, 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 the end of the Cold War. Um, and in late high, near, near the end of high school, many Germans would go abroad for a year. And most wanted to go to the US. The US for us back then, this is like 12 or 13 years ago, was cool and uh, there was pop culture and it was exciting and, uh, and rich. Um, so everybody wanted to go there. I had one friend who went to Poland and me and my other friends, we couldn't understand. We, 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 we looked him in the eye and we're like, why, what, what, is, what is Poland? We had no idea, but there was no, uh, we, we, there was no history classes on Poland. There was no uh, public discourse on, on um, Poland or on the, the, the entire region. Um, so it was kind of a, a a blind spot in our in our upbringing in our standard uh, high school education, um, and then maybe a second example. Um, my uh, my mother, for example, she's a she's a teacher in she's very traditionally we traditionally Western German, I would say, a French and politics teacher. I hope she's not listening right now. Um, and she still today um, makes jokes about very old jokes about Eastern Europe. Um, that that really reflect uh, that she has these prejudices in in her head, even though she would consider herself a left wing liberal educated um, woman. She still has these prejudices, and I think that's a very good example of how deeply rooted these are in Western Germany. So I would say. Uh, but yeah, I would say these, the, the, the division between Eastern and Western Europe is definitely, it, it, it's both. It's a myth and a reality. It's a myth because it's, it's, it's a created idea. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a created myth by humans. Um, there's this fascinating book by, by Larry Wolf, uh, Inventing Eastern Europe, where he says um, that it was actually in the Enlightenment, uh, so more than 200 years ago, that thinkers like Voltaire, they invented Eastern Europe as a concept for the first time. Before, people would think in terms of Northern versus Southern Europe, with Southern European, the Italian, Northern Italian Renaissance uh, area, Florence and so on, being civilized and educated. And the North of the Alps was the barbaric, dark and violent um, uh, place that nobody wanted to go. And that changed in the Enlightenment when, um, when Enlightenment thinkers from, from cities like Paris or London or, or the Netherlands started to, uh, to say, well, there's actually, we are the West, we are the civilized West, and there's the unknown East um, that is dangerous and exotic um, and so on and so forth. So this is definitely, a this is a created idea that there is this division um, in Europe, but obviously it resonates in people's heads still today. And this is what the examples that I gave show. So in that sense, it is today, unfortunately, I would say still a reality. People do think in these categories, at least in Germany, and it's really important to, to overcome that. So I'll, I'll stop for now. You're on mute still, Adam. Yes, you're right. Uh, I should 
have muted myself. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, where are you from? Which part of Germany? Uh, Münster in North Rhine-Westphalia. Okay, so yeah. Northwest Germany, very close. Yeah, to I know, I know. It's it's really far from uh, East Germany. From yes. Yeah, yeah. Deutsche Demokratische Republik. Okay. Um, so maybe right now I will give a floor to Vit. And uh, uh, Vit, please um, share with us your uh, uh, opinions on uh, this issue of division. And of course, uh, maybe you can say a little bit. Uh, about uh, the current developments in your country, uh, in Poland, uh, you can um, quite often meet with this opinion, okay, um, Czechs managed to stop this semi-authoritarian um, backsliding and so on uh, because of uh, the most recent election. So please, beat. Um, hello, hello everybody, and thank you for the invitation. Adam, uh, I'm not sure if I will have time actually to get to current situation because I really wanted to start with a very general perspective. And actually my first point was, was really kind of philosophical or epistemological uh, myth versus reality. I'm not sure we can separate myths from reality because uh, regardless of how deep we dig in archives, we always end up creating some interpretations of history, creating some myths. So uh, myths are reality and what we consider reality in this case becomes a myth because we are humans, not just the politicians are humans, uh, but also researchers are humans. Uh, not because we have some bad intentions, but because of uh, our cognition, because of, uh, of the language we use. Uh, we cannot escape making interpretations. Um, next point, I, I, my intention uh, with, uh, with my presentation was to actually start with a little bit of history, going back to uh, the return to Europe uh, and, um, and overcoming the division of Europe. Uh, I'm actually very grateful uh, to Catherine for starting on the same level, so I will try to somehow uh, respond uh, and maybe compliment. Again, I'm not an historian, I'm a political scientist, so please take that into account. Um, Overcoming the division, uh, the intention or, or, or the goal or, uh, or the rhetorics of overcoming the division uh, really corresponds to what Catherine mentioned. We wanted to get rid of the East-West division because it somehow erased Central Europe, not only from the maps, but also from the thinking of people. So um, I very much agree and appreciate uh, the, the reference to Kundera and to uh, his appeal uh, not to forget um, uh, about Central Europe. I'm also very grateful uh, to Catherine for mentioning uh, the victimization. Uh, the victimization is still present in the Czech political discourse. And it is one of the main sources of, of Euroscepticism, uh, the notion that we are always the victims of, uh, of great powers, that uh, we and the great powers are the founding countries uh, very often of uh, the European Union, especially France and Germany. Uh, so, and this contributes to uh, the Euroscepticism. So um, I very much appreciate it and I agree that it is a bad thing. Uh, how to fight it? The problem is that this sense of victimization is quite deeply rooted. And um, uh, maybe I will be a bit more provocative, but it's not just the Eurosceptics. It's not just the villains like Václav Klaus. Uh, but it could even, we can even blame Kundera for taking part in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this victimization. I actually took the opportunity of speaking uh, uh, now, uh, and I opened up Kundera's article on, uh, on, the, on the Czech destiny. And you can see 
uh, in, uh, in this article from 1960s, uh, his loathing uh, or suspicion towards the great powers, uh, his uh, suspicion towards uh, great powers as the ones who uh, tend to suppress, uh, who tend to create uniformity. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in his interpretation or in my interpretation of, uh, of Kundera, uh, he is in favor of rebellion against this uh, uh, suppression from, uh, from the great powers. So uh, it's, uh, it's slightly more complicated. It's not, uh, we may end up in a situation that those who advocate Central Europe as a way of overcoming the East-West division may actually contribute uh, to perpetuating uh, uh, the victimization narrative, which fuels the East-West divide. And this is actually uh, the real life history of the Visegrad group. The Visegrad group was established as a, as a way how to um, uh, how to overcome the East-West division by uh, putting uh, putting uh, Central Europe on uh, on the map, and uh, but it was created by mostly small or mid-sized countries, and uh, we ended up in a situation when these small and middle-sized countries. Why, uh, when they were trying to uh, somehow rehabilitate Central Europe, they ended up in the discourse of victimization, uh, being the victims of, uh, of, uh, of great powers. Uh, they started to become unhappy uh, with uh, being uh, lectured by the advanced uh, uh, advanced uh, Western European countries, or at least that was the interpretation of Central Europeans that we are being lectured, which was not always the case, because if you remember early 1990s, we were lecturing the West. You know, who am I talking about? I'm talking about Václav Havel, who went to the West and who was lecturing. You may remember his famous uh, uh, lecture in, uh, in the US Congress. Um, uh, so we were not always the one who were being lectured, but we created a myth that we are being lectured. And at certain point of time, we tried to turn the tables. I remember some of the Czech Eurosceptics arguing, look, uh, we are adults. We no longer accept being lectured. We want you to give lectures. I think it was Sasha Vondra uh, who, who said that in the early 2000s. And in certain aspects, you may uh, put uh, Orban into the same category. He is the one who is trying to lecture, who, who actually at certain point in time decided to turn the tables and said, okay, you, uh, the West, you became too, how to say it, um, you, you lost your moral compass, you lost your, um, uh, your uh, true European values, and I'm the one who will lecture you in what it means to be true European. Uh, so we, at certain time, uh, I, I'm talking about early 2000s, decided to turn the table. And we started to speak about new Europe. Um, the, the, the narrative was also associated at that time with, uh, with the geopolitical situation and international relations situation at that, that time. You may remember that the, the, the concept of new Europe was, uh, was promoted by, uh, by Rumsfeld at the time of uh, Iraqi crisis. Uh, so there was this kind of foreign policy dimension to it also. And it was actually quite happily embraced by, uh, by quite a few uh, Central European politicians 
as a way to uh, to turn the tables and try to reinvent uh, East as something positive, as uh, as not the one who is being uh, lectured, but by uh, by uh, by the one who is somehow trying to contribute it, contribute to uh, to the European to lecture Europe. The problem was that the Western Europe this time did not accept lecturing. The Western Europe, or the West generally, did accept being lectured from, uh, from Václav Havel, but the West did not accept being lectured from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, uh, from Orbán. Uh, so we ended up in a situation when uh, our lecturing is no longer accepted and actually contributes to uh, the, um, uh, the deepening of the divide between, uh, between East and West. The lecturing by Havel uh, uh, was a quite successful attempt to rehabilitate Europe, uh, Central Europe without creating East-West divide. Right now, we are in a situation when uh, the lecturing from people like, uh, like Orban is actually deepening, uh, uh, deepening the divide. And I think the problem is in the victimization. Uh, Havel is or was the one who actually quite explicitly rejected, even in 1960s, um, uh, Kundera's discourse of uh, uh, small countries uh, being the vic um, uh, victims of great powers uh, and the great uh, powers, uh, uh, that, that was the discourse of Kundera, that the great powers are uh, somehow uh, treacherous. Uh, how, as far as I remember, or according to my interpretation, Václav Havel already at that time rejected uh, this kind of victimization. And I think that this is one of the sources of his lecturing in 1990s, uh, that he uh, on one side did promote Central Europe without falling victim of, uh, of this uh, victimization stereotype. So that would be my, my, my lesson learned. Look, we can and we probably should reinvent ourselves uh, either as uh, a Central Europe or maybe even new Europe. But please do that without uh, the victimization narrative because if we, if we go that path, it's the path of not being listened to in the West, and it's the path of uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, actually deepening the East-West divide. Um, yeah. So <laughs> my contribution is on this kind of general level. We can go uh, to towards a bit more um, uh, specific or down-to-earth recommendations. Uh, recommendations from my side, don't fetishize uh, uh, Visegrad group, try to build alliances uh, with uh, uh, great powers, uh, try to normalize relations with great powers. I think there is a huge opportunity or potential in developing, I don't know, Weimar Triangle. Or, um, or check French bilateral relations. <laughs> you know, if you go into the history, uh, Czechoslovak and French relations were really deep, not just on the cultural level, that's one of the reasons why actually uh, Kundera chose Paris for his exile, but also on political military level. Um, if you go into uh, the intravora Czechoslovakia. So that's the strategy. Try to build alliances with small and mid-sized countries, but please beyond our region. Why the hell didn't we support Greece more? Uh, it, was, it was crazy during uh, uh, the economic crisis and migration crisis 
Greece was the bad one or uh, the the backward one. <laughs> that was that was funny. Uh, we in the Central Europe sometimes uh, perceive ourselves as being the laggards, but we always invent countries which are even more laggard than ourselves. And that was Greece during the economic crisis. At that time, we, the Czechs, imagined ourselves as being part of the norm, North, and Greeks were the uh, laggard, the, the lazy Greeks drinking ozo, as uh, Václav Klaus uh, uh, mentioned. So that would be my recommendation. Yes, it's sometimes okay uh, to build alliances with, uh, or, uh, uh, with uh, small and mid-size, but don't stick just with Central Europe. Try to, try to be more emphatic uh, with, even with countries like Greece. Um, yeah, I will stop here and uh, uh, I already talked too much and uh, I'm looking forward to what you think about it. We thank you very much. Definitely, you know, I didn't want to in, impose anything on you and to talk about the current situation in, in Czechia. Thank you, it was really great. In fact, uh, you brought some ingredients. We are moving to Istvan, uh, which is uh, really a great person. In fact, uh, he is this witness of history, a former politician, an NGO activist, and uh, a good expert, a really excellent one, uh, one of authors of, of articles uh, collected in our report. So really merging um, uh, and wearing more than two, three, in, in, in fact, two, three, four, five hats and uh, hats, I'm sorry. <laughs> so really each one, as you know, I, we can say that Vit uh, um, has already put on the table some ingredients uh, to to talk, you know that I like very much your cuisine, especially this famous fish soup, alasle. And in that case, let's talk about Hungary, which is sometimes presented as this really enfant terrible in the region. And we have everything: victimization, with uh, mentioned that. Yeah, and we have this um, um, Trianon syn uh, syndrome, of course. We have this idea that. Uh, maybe that's a, uh, I, I will be a little bit provocative. Yeah, it is right. Definitely, there is a strong opposition against Orban in the Western Europe, but there are also many guys who really admire him. And that's uh, uh, something new. And that's that he, he can say, Orban, yes, I'm a translator to, to a certain degree. I can uh, be proud of myself that, for instance, you have a book, Cultural Backlash, and there are three guys on the cover. Le Pen, Trump, and Orban. That's something, yeah. That's that. That's I can say that's a success. I'm joking, of course. Um, I'm ironic right now. So please, Istvan, share with us your position of, of the country. Which is, uh, I would like also um, from you to hear a little bit about the elections because they are, as uh, Professor Oral has already mentioned, that uh, these elections are really important. And uh, we, I think, uh, 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 we have right now. Six uh, uh, weeks, yeah, uh, have left. So please. Yeah, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, just uh, please let me speak uh, just a very few sentences about the general topic, and then I am going to speak about the very Hungarian case and the elections because certainly I understand that that's more exciting than any historical explanation once again. And I'm not a historian. I ha might have many hats, but I'm definitely not a historian. But still, I would like to add my uh, maybe naive or amateur uh, ideas to this uh, general discussion, arguing that uh, talking about an East-West divide is not simply an ex exaggeration, according my view, but it would be a political mistake. And uh, I have some uh, historic uh, examples arguing that there is nothing like uh, historic or cultural determinism. And even if we have, you know, our special history and geographic situation, uh, 
I, I can say that, you know, Scandinavia, you know better than I, many of you who are historians, had a, a very, you know, different history in the 19th century. And following that period, these peasant societies had a much more successful uh, historic uh, track. And when you mentioned corruption, that made me think about Scandinavia. Now they are number one, number two, number three, and so on regarding the fight against corruption or lack of corruption. No one would have imagined it, I think, 100 or 150 years ago. And other countries might have had a different historic track. Maybe we were a little bit less luckier than, than Sweden, which was neutral uh, in, the in the 20th century. But I have just listened to another presentation uh, the other day by Timothy Snyder about Ukraine. And that I would like to add, even Ukraine, which is really East Europe or Eastern Europe, uh, had a history which is, you know, what he said is normal is very much a typical European history. And I understand that there is a time difference regarding our development in what I would call Central Europe or East Central Europe. And certainly that's true for Eastern Europe, Ukraine or Russia and so on. But in many cases, uh, I would say that when you talked about uh, Franz Josef, till the beginning of the First World War, Actually, the Central European region and mostly Hungary was able to catch up and it has become more and more and more a normal or typical uh, European country again after a long history before the Turks invaded this, these regions and beyond our region. So um, to put it very shortly, I think that uh, the, the future is open because the past is open too, as some people say, how we interpret it. And we shouldn't accept this, uh, this uh, very mythical, but very uh, unjustifiable uh, uh, dividing line saying that this is East and West. I think, and this is my last point about history, because again, I'm not a historian, the communist period, made it even worse. Certainly the Iron Curtain, which language was used mostly on the West. Maybe we here in the East, I mean, in the Eastern Bloc, that's another expression, what was used mostly in the West. In the worst Warsaw Pact countries, I would say, or a Soviet satellite say, state, we knew that there is nothing like a real Iron Curtain, but some people in France or Germany believed that there is an existing physical Iron Curtain between the two uh, political systems. So when we had a different political system, that created a real dividing line. Now, what happened in 1989, that was very important that in, in Hungary, and I think in many other countries around us, we did not want to invent something very special, something very new, which is different from the Western model. We wanted to go back to Europe, even if it is a strange expression, and maybe we were before that in Europe, a European country and many other neighboring countries too. But what we had in mind in, in Hungary and in other countries, that was the unification of Europe. And as a political system, we wanted, it was a liberal era, a liberal democracy, similar to the Western established democratic models, nothing really new. Well, there were some ideas about the third way. And there were some ideas about, uh, especially in the interwar period, a Hungarian Switzerland, a sort of different non-capitalist uh, future. These all evaporated in 89 and 1990. And it was not only real politic, but that was the wish of most of the political parties and intellectuals and, and political entrepreneurs who got votes at the election, which probably expressed the wish of the people that we want to join 
the West. So the West is still an existing category in my mind, and I think in Hungary and beyond, where originally in 89-90, we wanted to belong to, we wanted to belong to the democratic community of Europe. And that was the wonderful idea back in 1989. Certainly in most cases, liberal ideas came together with the idea of getting back sovereignty, either from the Soviet Union as a satellite state or a real sovereignty, like in the case of the Baltic uh, countries, which were not independent from the Soviet Union. Now, what I would like to add uh, uh, very shortly that 1989 as a, as a liberal era, uh, and I mean also in economic terms, uh, market, market reforms and market freedoms, which were introduced, logically led to our accession to the European Union. So the unification of Europe is, has actually uh, happened. It has occurred. And I agree that it was a success story. It took a little bit long uh, from 1989, 15 years in our case, in, and in most cases, and people were uh, uh, were not happy that this this process was so long, and there were a lot of misunderstandings about the accession procedures and processes, how it uh, happened. But on the other hand, it's true that because we joined the West, it created a psychological psychological situation when we were the students and the Westerners were our teachers and the European institutions have become the teachers who the commission uh, had each year a sort of progress report uh, saying how far we actually went ahead. This again created a sort of inferiority feeling what we already had towards the West, which was richer and much more democratic and was luckier in the last 40 years. Now, uh, a big jump ahead. What, what happened later on? When Viktor Orban got back to power once again in 2010 with a huge two-third majority, he somehow misused these, three, these uh, ambivalent feelings of the people to the West. We wanted to copy the West, but we also were a little bit uh, hurt that they were luckier than us. And there were already some myths uh, very well known in Hungary that, for example, the Western countries did not help us in 1956 during our revolution. This was not a real political assumption, but a, a, a complaint in general against the West, which left us in the Soviet Eastern Bloc. So there were some roots, certainly, in the Hungarian mentality, which could have been used by Orban and his friends to create, in a very short period, a sort of anti brussels rhetoric. When they invented the story that Brussels wants to colonize us, you wouldn't have thought in 2004, or especially in, in, in 1991, let's say, that this rhetoric would be possible by a ruling party in Hungary without losing the next elections. And it did not lose the next election, but won once again with a two-third majority. But I would still argue that Fidesz won elections in sequence, not because of their specific anti-European rhetoric, but very often in contrast to that. So when we try to find the reasons why populist, authoritarian, and semi-authoritarian parties. We have now a hybrid regime in Hungary. You know, it's not a full-fledged dictatorship. It's not a liberal democracy anymore. We are somewhere in between. So why these parties could win elections? The explanation is mostly rooted not in, its, in the Eurosceptic or anti-European rhetorics of these parties, at least in Hungary, but I think it's true elsewhere also, but because of many other phenomena. And that brings back to my point that we shouldn't exaggerate the East-West divide uh, because what we see today 
and maybe I say it because I'm not a historian, but I think this is a very 21st century phenomenon, what we see today. And in different countries, uh, political parties and you know, charismatic leaders might use history and memory on their own side. And in the case of Hungary, Orban uses the Horthy era, what, what we discussed already, and it changed the landscape around the parliament, bringing back statues. And it, it had, Orban and his government has a new narrative about the Second World War, 1956, uh, the fall of communism, and so on and so on. Uh, that's all true. In some cases, it, it res, reminds us not the Horthy regime, but even the 50s, the, the Rakoshi regime, in rhetoric at least. When Orban and Fidesz mobilizes its people, he, he calls it, or an NGO which supports Orban and is certainly financed by the state budget, argues that this is a peace march, which is exactly the same rhetoric what in the 50s was used when they say that this is a peace fight. Even coal mining was part of peace fight in the 50s. Now it's a peace march against Brussels. So it reminds me to the rhetoric of the 50s as well. But what we have today is, use, is, a, is a regime which is illiberal, populist, semi-authoritarian, which is a 21st century phenomenon. And what I want to say that in that sense, if we forget about the historic roots and the past dependency, what we all have, it's striking how much Hungarian populism, illiberalism, Polish populism and illiberalism are more or less the same, like Trump's political rhetoric or Marine Le Pen's political rhetoric. The enemy, the outgroup, how they talk about migrants, minorities, LGBTQ rights groups, uh, liberals, secular Europeans, European liberal elites, Brussels, then it's strikingly the same language. So what I would like to say that partly independently how these political parties uh, grasp political power, uh, now they are united in a way in their rhetoric, anti-European sentiments and so on. So we have to find other reasons. And certainly there are other reasons how they got to power, how they misused, created an authoritarian rhetoric, uh, seducing voters, mostly on the traditional right, but also integrating in their camps those with a new right-wing identity politics who probably would not have voted for conservatives, but at least in the, in the la at the last elections in Hungary, they did so. Now, what might happen on the 3rd of April in Hungary? That is a very open question, and I don't know the answer. What I can tell you that there were some changes, as you probably all know, and now we have a more or less united opposition in Hungary. This is a very strange uh, coalition of different parties, including former extremists like Jobbik, which was even more on the far right than Fidesz a couple of years ago, but moved to the center. And today it's a sort of national conservative Christian party. Not everybody is liberal. In a coalition uh, of parties, which had to make a coalition before the elections because of the election rules and not after uh, an election. So we are not in Germany. These parties had to create a coalition in order to have any chance to beat Orban. And, and they have only one candidate now in each constituency against one candidate of Fidesz. That's the only chance how to overcome a populist uh, party. Now, what are the chances? The chances are not bad, actually. We have a new uh, uh, prime minister candidate who doesn't come from the very left or from the traditional liberal uh, scene from Budapest, 
but he, as you know, comes from a, a small town, more a village maybe, I would say, a big village, a small town, uh, from a rural area, from a right-wing area, where he already won a couple of years ago, and he is the mayor of that uh, 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 small town. Now, he, he describes himself as a conservative Christian and uh, Christian Democrat uh, center-right uh, candidate. What I would like to add this, that he's a conservative liberal. He doesn't emphasize it, but it's important that he is not a fundamentalist Christian. He doesn't want to introduce Catholic education at state universities or anything like that. He's, he certainly represents the political program of the six parties, and he seems to be a tolerant guy also in religious issues. But he is the guy who might seduce in the center, if we have people like that, he's still in the center, undecided voters, former Fidesz voters who are now fed up with Orban. And he has the chance to, to open up the camp towards these guys and to uh, have uh, extra voters for the opposition. Now, that is the chance. The, we have a lot of problems. The six parties are still quarreling with, with each other. And maybe our can, the candidate of the opposition made some mistakes. That also might be a problem uh, in political communication. But it seems to be that Orban and Fidesz is not so strong enough. According to the polls, the chances are 50 to 50. Now the opposition needs more than 50, 53, 45, because of the electoral rules and because of the constituencies after so many gerrymandering, 50% plus one vote would not be enough. But first time after 12 years, the race is open and there might be hopes that this illiberal anti-European course will be over soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Istvan, for your intervention. I'm very grateful that you focused on the elections because, uh, as we already, already said several times, they're very important. By the way, uh, they, uh, David, uh, you raised your hand. Yeah, you, uh, Do you want to say something? Uh, depends on the time. I thought I was uh, invited please, to present please, some please. results on the... Yeah, brief. okay. Because I just wanted to uh, jump in on what uh, Istvan said about um, uh, many, like the Hungarian population being pro-European and actually not supporting the values that, uh, or not supporting most of the values that Orban stands for, because we've just done a study on exactly this. And I, maybe I can take one minute or two to share the results because it's it really... Um, Fits. Um, let me share my screen. So we asked uh, people in Central and Eastern Europe uh, about their opinion on the values that are displayed here. So, uh, and these are the values that are written down in uh, Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. So pluralism, rule of law, rights of minorities, and so on and so forth. And we found that there is an overall support of these values. These values are supported, uh, almost all of them, by more than half of the population. Um, many people don't have specific um, ideas about these values, so they answered neutral. Um, and only a minor minority of uh, like 15 to 25 percent um, disagrees with these values. And I'm sure that if we did a similar study in Western European countries, we would probably find exactly um, the same results. Um, another example is we, uh, the, this is the, their assessment of uh, the accession to the um, to the European Union of the respective countries, and we see an overall support or positive assessment uh, on the effects of the accession to the European Union across all countries that we that we surveyed. Um, 76% of the respondents of these countries said, my country should learn from the European Union and not the other way around. So this is exactly contrary to what Viktor Orban says, who says, uh, who's turning around the, the narrative and says, now Western Europe has to learn from us. Uh, the population doesn't go along with that, um, as, as shown in this slide. And well, the, the one big outlier that we found was uh, asylum policy 
Um, but again, I think we would find similar results in um, many Western European countries. But this was really this was the only value where you could really see, okay, more people are against um, uh, an open asylum policy than are in favor of it. But so in in, in general, we found um, that that uh, that that disagreement with potential disagreement with, with liberal or European values cannot be the explanation for Viktor Orban or Kaczynski. That's yeah. Um, that that was my point. And now I try to stop sharing my ah here it is okay sorry. Thank you very much, David. Of course, we don't have time to discuss that. But the devil is in the details. Yeah, for example, attitude to immigrants, and refugees uh, in our region. That's according to many surveys, opinion poll. We can say uh, quite often depends on their. Uh, religious background for example there is a problem with islamophobia definitely in our countries uh, quite often higher than for instance in certain western european countries but again you can find examples of western european countries so we can talk and talk unfortunately we don't have a time next time but you definitely showed certain contradictions that certain party parties and um, really enjoy popularity and at the same time the society quite often um, um, there is no overlapping uh, between their electorate on certain important issues, and but still people uh, support uh, in uh, uh, these parties uh, in, uh, during elections. That's a problem. Vit, you wanted to add something? No. Uh, so uh, maybe, really, I'm very sorry because uh, we are running out of time. Maybe I will ask uh, Professor Oren. If you want to add something, maybe you wrap up. Uh, um, it's a little bit like, you know, Urbi et Orbi, the message of our Pope. Please, if you want to do something like that. Uh, maybe you, yeah, I learned quite a lot. Thank you very much for your intervention. So maybe, um, uh, Professor Orr, you can um, share with us um, your. Um, uh, 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 your impressions uh, from from uh, your that uh, you may be also some lessons learned from uh, or uh, drawn from uh, our uh, debate. Please, the floor is well, yours. Yes, well, thank you. No, no, I will not. I will not uh, monopolize the, the 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 debate now. I I learned myself also a lot from uh, from your uh, interventions, and I I would really uh, now join with with Istvan to uh, say that we have to observe. Uh, what is going to take place in Hungary on the 3rd of April, because it could have consequences, I mean, positive consequences uh, for not only for Hungary itself, of course, herself, but also also to break up this, uh, to bring this uh, divide we were talking about, and uh, maybe to inspire uh, other changes um, in uh, in uh, in Europe. And I was I was in Poznan at the beginning of, of January, and I, I had the, the chance to talk with many of my colleagues there, um, historians, fellow historians, and and some some of them said, uh, well, maybe uh, if Hungary uh, succeeds in in uh, uh, reverse uh, this uh, this uh, Orban uh, uh, period, maybe that should be something for us to learn from. So uh, I'm I'm only an historian. I'm not I'm not a politologist. I'm not a, a prophet <laughs> either, uh, nor nor a, a magician. So let's let's hope for the best, and also that. Uh, public, uh, uh, the public, the citizens, uh, take their fate again in their own hands. And that's, I think that's, and that would be a very positive sign also for the West, because you were all right, uh, all of you, to insist on the fact that it is the West which also uh, creates the divide and maintains the divide. So uh, if Hungary would come back to what happened in 89 and be the, and be the force Behind which uh, the other, some other countries could uh, could uh, unite. That would be that would be a wonderful a wonderful thing. Thank you. Sorry, you are muted. <laughs> Again, I forgot. Thank you very sorry for that. Thank you very much. That was really, I think, will be at Orbi the message. 
and uh, um, of course uh, uh, we are right now going to watch uh, uh, our documentary movie by the way uh, Istvan uh, is definitely one of our heroes interviews in this movie so we will you will see him again and of course um, uh, we uh, had also some uh, questions, on, but unfortunately we don't have a uh, time on our chat. For example, from Piotr Sula, um, there was a question about, uh, um, the question is if the people understood that notion of pluralism, that, that's a crucial uh, question. What does it mean for people, things like pluralism, gender equality, and so on? Sometimes, of course, we have to scratch the surface. And the devil is in the details, definitely for another discussion. And Shamal Hussein, does the immigration process from Middle East affecting the process of democracy in Europe? Yes, that, that, that as I said, that definitely this is the issue in the region, not only in the region, but again, no time. So right now we are not going to have concluding remarks, closing remarks after the movie, because I think right now we should. So I would like to thank you very much. I'm great. Uh, very grateful for your uh, interventions. It was really great, uh, a great pleasure for me. And I hope also um, uh, that our audience really enjoyed our discussion. And uh, right now, I would like to um, encourage all of you uh, very much to watch our movie. And that's the end of our project. But I hope it's just the beginning of a very beautiful friendship because, um, in fact, we still cooperate and the topic, uh, for instance, on the reunification of Germany with the um, Institute for Europäische Politik. So we are staying in touch. See you soon. Watch the movie. It's a really, uh, I, I think it's a very nice movie. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gdansk is known both for its magnificent architecture and its canals, which reflect the richness of Central Europe's cultural heritage. A powerful commercial hub in the past, Gdansk has also played a significant role in the turbulent history of the 20th century. Here began the Second World War, but the city also had a key role to play in the fall of communism. The shipyards in Gdansk have emerged as a symbolic location concerning the 1980s democratic movements which swept across Central Europe. They saw the birth of Solidarity, an independent and self-governing trade union. However, the Gdansk shipyards are not the only symbols of the revolution of 1989. Other locations across Central Europe also played a significant part in the autumn of nations. Indeed, the same may be said for Wenceslas Square in Prague, the Hungarian-Austrian border, or the Berlin Wall. In 1989, civic movements developed throughout Central Europe and led to both political and economic transitions, which allowed the future integration of the region into the European Union. However, 1989 is mainly about people, their strength and drive for a better tomorrow. Some of the witnesses and active participants of that time give us a glimpse of what it was like in 1989, how these changes led to the enlargement of the European Union in 2004, and how it influences today's Europe and the world. 1989, the most important year of the transition, the Annus Mirabilis, the year of miracles. Really, that was a fantastic year, but every day brought something new, something uh, prosperous, something very important uh, to us. What happened lay after the regime change, as we call it in Hungary, it was really a successful period for the country and for the whole region of Central Europe, both for Poland, Hungary and the other countries uh, in the close to us, uh, the Czechs, the Slovaks, the East Germans and so on, and even in Southeastern Europe on the Balkans. So whatever happened later on and whatever people say and might have lost their so-called illusions, this change was uh, a wonderful experience for many of us. First of all, who participated in the events, but also for those who simply uh, enjoyed the benefits of political freedom and uh, the market economy later on. 1989, the Velvet Revolution showed uh, that uh, uh, there is an end to any and every totalitarian regime uh, if you have a clear vision 
if you have leaders that are able to really guide uh, uh, the masses, if you have uh, the political and human courage, and uh, if you have the ability to take these decisions. And I think that uh, this is an important lesson, not just to us, but to people in Cuba, in Iran, or in any other state in the world, uh, which uh, uh, unfortunately uh, does uh, uh, basically apply totalitarian uh, practices on, on its own population. I think the most important lesson from that time in the end of the 80s is that is the lesson to understand you can change things. Nothing has to remain as it is and you are able together with others to change things, to change your own society and much more than that together in a community with others you are able to change things to get better revolutions when they come they do so unexpectedly you cannot predict in advance when will the tipping point come you never know which stone when turned will release an avalanche if you look at the year 1989, uh, one month ahead uh, of the crumbling down of the Berlin Wall, no one was expecting uh, what eventually came. Everybody was expecting uh, a slow, gradual decay of the regime in East Germany. One month ahead of the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, those who knew the country were overall expecting a long, drawn-out process of decay process of gradual adaptation to the change elsewhere in Europe, but generally continuity of the regime. One month ahead of uh, the bloody events uh, in December 89 in Romania and the toppling of Romanian dictator Ceausescu, those who knew the country were all expecting uh, that this country would continue its own authoritarian ways uh, for some indeterminate uh, future. And yet, revolutions came throughout the eastern half of the continent. So the, what is the lesson? The lesson is to be prepared. The lesson is to organize yourselves. The lesson is uh, to work at the grassroots level. The worst lesson is to think ahead and uh, imagine your country uh, when it uh, <clears throat> Uh, goes the way of democracy, the way of the market economy. That's the lesson for all those who still suffer under the authoritarian, undemocratic regimes, and we have a few of them still, unfortunately, also in Europe. Freedom is not a given. It should not be taken for granted. It has to be fought for. It comes at a price, sometimes a great personal price, and we should not assume it is there to stay forever without us as citizens, as people doing no nothing, enjoying our lives and just sitting and watching the world. It has to be watched. The politicians have to be watched because what can happen is that it, freedom ebbs and flows. So we should take care of it and be vigilant. The 90s were not easy. Democratic and economic transitions required a lot of patience and resilience from Central European societies. Such economic transitions impacted heavily the daily lives of citizens, sometimes negatively. We are standing in front of the European Centre of Solidarity, which was opened in 2014 and is a symbol of European integration. Today, European Union membership is something natural and obvious for many young Europeans. However, we should not forget that this process was most demanding. Without doubt, the reunification of Germany in 1990 and the commitment of Germany to the European integration of Central Europe facilitated considerably the accession process for the region. Nevertheless, European integration remains a perpetual process and a daily struggle with both its successes and failures. Germany, this Helmut Kohl, played an important role to convince the other European states to integrate with new democracies, to make clear that it is structural the right of new democracies to get members. And so I think 
that Germany in the 90s played an important role in that way of integration. And I'm happy about that we in East Germany not just succeeded in democracy, but also in unification and the enlargement of Europe, shaping together a new Europe, which hopefully is a basis for good welfare, freedom, not only for us in Europe, but also for our neighbors and to play a good role in the world. European Union uh, was for me always a value community. It's not about the money and not about the financial advantages and financial benefits. For me, it's, it's much more about values, uh, norms and standards. I think that the, probably the key success uh, for Europe's enlargement uh, in 2004 is that we at Poland felt that we are coming back to where we belonged, but for political reasons, for the uh, for reasons of Europe being divided into between uh, between two uh, political blocks, we could not enjoy. Well, the enlargement of 2004 brought an unprecedented uh, acceleration of economic growth, uh, catching up uh, of the eastern part of the continent uh, with Western Europe, uh, rise in living standards and the overall uh, increase of well-being in those countries. I think that this is the key success. Of course, it didn't come without cost. And of course, some of the economies in our region suffered greatly from the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Nonetheless, if you look at the situation of today and compare it with the situation of 2004, you see that everybody got uh, uh, success everybody was able to catch up uh, with the most affluent economies uh, of, the, uh, of the western part of, uh, of the continent. Uh, I would regard this as the key success, therefore. And I think that the biggest success is that even though it is not 100% uh, that uh, a, la a large part of us, and especially the young people have understood that and are a part of it and are able, unlike some of other generations, mine and older ones, in fact, uh, to be really very much not just integrated, but involved. And I think that uh, it's not about what is the biggest success uh, of uh, enlargement 2004. We can say yes, bringing stability, security, safety, you know, enlarging internal market investment and so on. But the biggest issue is uh, what will be the success, what is yet ahead of us, and the ability to in fact uh, identify that and work on it together and make it happen. If I look back to the negotiation process, so was it very important that the new members, the negotiating new democracies, had to meet criteria. And for instance, criteria of meeting democracy values. And this was a strong criteria, even uh, towards minorities, to give minorities rights. Democracy is not just um, the imperial majority. Minority in a democracy have rights. Uh, and many had to understand it. But we failed to understand that European Union should establish mechanism to make strong these criteria not just for candidates but also for members. I have got some disappointment and, and some astonish astonishment because I firmly believed in that, that European Union can keep Hungary on the right track related rule of law, democracy and human rights. Unfortunately, it did not come true. Many of us still believe that uh, a united Europe is the only future for all of us and Hungary and Poland and many other Central European countries can only find their place inside the European Union. So we are fighting continuously for a united Europe when all the member states are equal. But we also have 
supranational institutions of a united European structure. And we believe that this is the way out. Europe we have been negotiating was Europe which over the years we didn't realize that it should have had more human face as uh, transformed into the Polish legislation and Polish social practice. Uh, the failure of European thinking or of at least what we took for European thinking in Poland was too much uh, space being given to the idea that you either swim or sink. And there were people who felt that they were left to fend for themselves too much by the state based on so-called European ideas of free competition. The key failure, I think, uh, is our collective European inability to constrain uh, the uh, authoritarian populism, uh, to address uh, the issues uh, uh, which emerged uh, practically everywhere in Europe. The main thing in Europe uh, is mutual trust. It matters uh, if I know that I can trust you. Uh, if that trust disappears, then we are dealing with a transactional uh, um, situation where everybody is looking uh, after his or her own interest first and doesn't care much about the interests of the others. Uh, we need a community of values. We need a community based on trust. Uh, if we don't have that, then everything will go down. Uh, of course, not in a matter of one month or one year, but it will inevitably go down. So we must uh, find ways and means of dealing more effectively with uh, the authoritarian populism. 1989 and 2004 were very important moments in the history of modern Europe, and it is essential that every European citizen takes ownership of these events. Let all of us together draw from the lessons of 1989 and 2004 in order to better understand the Europe of today. A Europe in which the Central European countries have both a role to play but also responsibilities. A Europe impacted by a pandemic and in which doubts about its future are growing. A Europe in which we are witnessing both attacks on its democratic principles and on its values. However, 1989 and 2004 have taught us one most important thing. If the citizens of a common Europe are willing to fight for their freedom and cooperate, we can guarantee that the Union will prevail.